And what I'll do in the next 20 to 25 minutes is just try to present some information around an example which Dr. Coates already introduced, and that's vitamin D. Uh, there's not going to be any solutions here, but rather kind of the scope of the problem and some of the things we need to start getting our hand around. Uh, first off, the disclosures. Um, I do uh, provide advice or comments to a number of boards, and including some supplement companies, Primarily, though, in the area of reproductive toxicology, so I don't think it actually uh, represents any conflict of interest. There, there's a number of take-home points that I, that I hope can be delivered in, uh, in the next 20 minutes. And the, the first, I think, is one that 10 years ago really wasn't well accepted. Now we're kind of saying you know, suboptimal vitamin D status isn't rare. In fact, maybe it's quite common. Uh, the idea that D deficiency arises through multiple mechanisms, not just diets which have inadequate amounts. Uh, one that's becoming more embraced is that vitamin D has multiple functions beyond bone health, uh, that the optimal intakes of D uh, may significantly exceed what a natural diet can provide, so it kind of puts it in a different category. Just eating a good diet is not going to do it for us. But then the tricky one is that maybe for some individuals, optimal intakes of vitamin D actually could exceed easily the current ULs for this nutrient. So it puts us in the situation of saying, you know, what should we be doing and how quickly do we have to get there? I'm going to open with some slides because it's easy to forget how we, we got there. Why are we doing vitamin D at all? It was the mid-1600s when Ricketts was first described in children in England. Uh, what's really characteristic of this is it's early developmental disorder, though if it's not prevented, it obviously persists throughout one's life. In the late 1800s, and I think this is the number that it's easy for people today not to necessarily be aware of, the prevalence was 60, 70, 80, 90 percent in many countries. So this is an extremely common disease. And it was also in the late 1800s where the concept that maybe this was, had something to do with the environment vis-a-vis -vis the sunshine uh, came out of work by Palm, who made the observation that you hardly ever saw rickets in Japan if people were in bright, sunny areas. But probably the real breakthrough paper uh, that got very little attention came out of the London Zoo, where Blandon Sutton made the observation that lions that were fed poor diets got a metabolic bone disease. It looked remarkably like rickets, and ultimately that was the diet that was used to study the development of rickets in rat models. But it wasn't until 1919, so less than 100 years ago, that the link to UV radiation was made. 1922, McCollum found that when you took out vitamin A from cod liver oil, which was being used to commonly treat children, uh, that you still could go ahead and cure rickets, and that's was where the, the story kind of started taking more of a vitamin approach, and it wasn't just dealing with UV radiation. In the 1930s, vitamin D fortification of milk occurred, supplements sent up 400 IUs per liter. Um, there was nothing magic about that. That was the approximate amount of vitamin D that you got in the teaspoon of cod liver oil, which was also shown to be efficacious. So no dose responses, it's just this probably works. And it wasn't until the late 60s that the act of vitamin D form, the 125 was identified and it was reclassified as a hormone. So this is a pretty new science when you really think about it. And it's now in the 80s and 90s where vitamin D modulated, the immune system was accepted. But it's that last decade that it's been associated with a host of other pathologies behind, besides rickets, which people like to think we've effectively cured. And this is where you have, start having discussions of, well, was the amount that we thought was good for bone disease? Is it going to do this host of other things, ranging from multiple sclerosis to rheumatoid arthritis to blood pressure? Or, in fact, did the claims have any substance? The field, uh, to say is exploding, would be an understatement. Uh, it's a pretty sleepy field if you look at vitamin D for the first uh, 1910 to about 1960. And now we're having this astronomical increase. So when you talk about, well, you have to constantly go back and see what's in the literature, do your meta-analysis, this is maybe an example of a nutrient where we have to reevaluate almost every six months because of the number of papers that are flying off the press.
At the same time, we're beginning to have the suspicion that we're seeing reemergence of classic vitamin D deficiency. Uh, there are cases of rickets being reported again in the United States. Uh, there's been numerous papers now suggesting that in pregnant women, vitamin D deficiency, as assessed by low vitamin circulating D, is common. Uh, so the idea that it's a major modulator of bone development is something that the Teratology Society has been struggling with, because how could this be something we effectively eradicated 100 years ago is coming back. And there's some new twists that are also occurring. In the last few years, uh, with in vitro fertilization, the observation has been made by a number of authors now that if you look at women who have effectively low, not significant, seriously low, but just marginally low levels of 25-hydroxy in the plasma prior to uh, get, uh, ovum donation, that they have a significantly poor rate of having success, successful uh, implantations. And very recently, only a few months ago, it was suggested that this could be almost a difference of close to two, uh, twofold in terms of successful clinical pregnancies. So the idea that vitamin D status, either preconception or early peri-implantation, may be an important modulator of embryonic implantation subsequent development is extremely new. And the, and the suggestion is, is that, again, it's relatively high levels of vitamin D are being prescribed in a number of clinical trials to see if this can be overcome. Buried in some of this work, though, is something which I'll come allude to a few times in my presentation, is that it looks like different racial groups show slightly different responses. So why this pretty clear link in terms of vitro fertilization is evident amongst white populations, uh, it's not as strongly observed in black, Asian, or Hispanic. Now, whether this will stand the test of time as the number of cases go up is unclear, but there's this kind of constant hit in the, hint in the vitamin D literature that different genetic groups may have different, very different responses to D deficiency as well as to supplemental vitamin D. Another disorder which is getting attention for a potential modulatory role of vitamin D is preeclampsia. And there have now been several papers in the last few years suggesting that, again, women who have low serum vitamin D levels, and the specifics of what is low, adequate, deficient, I don't want to get into today because I think the precision around those numbers can be questioned anyway, uh, that you see a significant increase for severe preeclampsia, though not just, uh, just eclampsia. That has cause for the initial concern for the woman's health, but also children born to women who have preeclampsia are now being reported to have an increased risk later for cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome. And again, relatively high levels of vitamin D are being tested in a number of clinical trials to see if the uh, risk of preeclampsia can be dropped. When one says how large is this problem, and it, it can be staggering if we, accept, if we assume the current cutoff values for 25-hydroxy D in plasma are correct. So using the Endocrine Society's number 37, it's somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of the women in an area, uh, Oakland, California, that were tested during pregnancy, as well as their neonates, were reported to have levels that we would classify as being deficient. Similarly, looking at the breastfed infants, there's now a number of suggestions that breast milk, first off, is low in vitamin D implications of that we'll come back to in a moment. And it's now becoming a little more common to see rickets in exclusively breastfed infants. So again, here's we have a dueling public health message where individuals are encouraged, certainly, to breastfeed, and yet we're beginning to see um, a significant number of cases coming up again, and very heavily slanted uh, towards some ethnic groups. So up to this point, at least the data would suggest it's around 80 percent of the children's uh, children with rickets are African Americans. So this, this, this idea that we, well, we had a disorder, we effectively eradicated it, um, and that's what we then still say, well, how can we assess vitamin D status in populations? Uh, a number of factors have conspired that say this disease is coming back, and so public attention to vitamin D is coming, is coming in. Curiously, 
If you look at the use of vitamin D supplements in infants uh, around the world, it tends to be relatively high. It's around ranging from 20% to about 50%. Uh, quite noticeably, it's extremely low in uh, two countries, the US and Australia. Uh, it's a little hard to say why is it so dramatically lower, other than perhaps there is the perception uh, among populations in these two countries that their vitamin D status is fine. So there is no real need. And this could be one of the reasons that the uh, cases of records are being re-reported. There's often the assumption that vitamin D being provided by supplements uh, also takes care of the problem. But at least in Haynes data from 2001, 2008, again suggests that if you just look at intake levels, that it's around 40 to 50 percent of the population have dietary intakes, and that's including the use of multivitamin mineral supplements. Uh, about, it's about half which are consuming diets and supplement use, which are less than 50 percent. So overall, this, this one gets the sense either the numbers are wrong and we should lower what is considered adequacy, or alternatively, suboptimal vitamin D deficiency is a lot more frequent than most people tend to appreciate. That partially is, explains this big surge of research papers that's occurred over the last decade. A little more tricky is dueling public health messages which are out there. Um, the consumption of vitamin D fortified milk clearly was a public health success. It reduces the incidence of D deficiency, certainly uh, probably was the principal factor reducing the risk for the occurrence of records in this country. The question, though, that has not been studied in great depth is what happens when individuals make efforts to improve their health by reducing their intake of dairy products? It's actually quite common. Uh, what happens when individuals try to improve their health by reducing sun exposure? Extremely common, and some would argue it's one of the more uh, likely causes for the increased uh, vitamin D deficiency we're seeing. And that, in part, comes from reports out of the Middle East that if you look at the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency, it's exceedingly high when you look at the populations which heavily conceal their bodies uh, with clothes. Uh, it, vitamin D deficiency being reported to be as high as 20 percent from data less than seven or eight years ago. And then we have the modeling question of, well, we want to get our hands around what's really influencing vitamin D status, and it's a bit of a nightmare. Uh, sunscreen exposure, not as much as many people think, but protective clothing. Uh, oftentimes your typical nutrition study is not going to ask a person how much clothing that they wear, how heavy is it, are their arms exposed or not. The latitude, season of the year, time of day, pollution, cloud cover, all can impact on D status, along with simply your dietary intake and the potential use of supplements. But there's also a number of modifying factors, smoking, alcohol, drugs, medication, obesity, but body fat has a huge effect on circulating serum pools if you're having low levels of vitamin D status. And bariatric surgery is becoming a more common cause of vitamin D deficiency. So when you're trying to say, well, what should be the D intake of a population, to some extent, when you have all of these variables going there, you have to ask, well, how much do you fudge your factors, how much do you make the assumption that the person's going to have very heavy clothing, that they live in a cloudy area? Um, we kind of do that currently, but we don't do it very often. And then we are basically struggling with whose numbers do we use? Uh, the Institute of Medicine, or do we use the Endocrine Society? It's about a 40 percent difference as to where the two groups suggest deficiency can be evidenced in terms of 25 hydroxy D concentrations, and a similar difference is about insufficiency or sufficiency. When you get to potential adverse effects, the real difference raises its head, though, because the Institute of Medicine suggests it's over 125 nanomoles per liter. No cutoff value is given by the Endocrine Society. So we have this kind of interesting dilemma that if you say, well, what's my D status? Am I safe? Am I not safe? To some extent, you say, well, by whom? What public agency are we going to pay attention to? Um, and that's a bit discomforting at this point in time. And some of this is related to the change in expectations we have of vitamin D. Uh, 
the fit, you know, when you go from 200 to 600 between the 97 to 2011 IOM recommendations for D intake, um, I think it shows two things. Uh, one, that there's a lot of flexibility in the IOM, and there certainly is, is openness to new data. But the other is it really underscores how poorly we understand this particular vitamin if you're going to have a threefold change in a recommendation in that short time period. The UL is the same sort of category. In 2011, the IOM reported an increase uh, at the UL that was 100% from the 1997 data, going up to 4,000 IUs. That 4,000 IU is a number, it's a common here, that if you look at ongoing clinical trials, uh, particularly in the area of cardiovascular health, that 4,000 to about 8,000 IUs a day is what you routinely see being published in a number of papers. Uh, raises an interesting question, because you could say, well, that's a therapeutic dose, they're dealing with sick patients. On the other hand, we should be able to pull from those studies particularly if the, author, uh, the individual investigators who are doing it are encouraged to collect safety data. Some real solid information. Um, as has been stated before, we don't do human toxic nutrient toxicity studies, but we do efficacious studies. And, and for all due extent, there's no reason we cannot substantially improve our database here. And I have this slide in because it's kind of, again, one of the sleeping problems out there that People are aware of it, but we don't know what the size of the dimension is. Uh, with bariatric surgeries, about 340 to 350,000 per year going on, the population of post-bariatric uh, patients that we estimate in the U.S. within 10 years is somewhere around one and a half and two million individuals. Uh, a significant group of individuals that we have to start asking, should they almost have their own DRIs? And it'll be very complicated because they're not just D deficient, but they're deficient in multiple vitamins and minerals. And you know, how do we start assessing them in, in, in these trials? So the, the debate that's come up a little bit already today is, is bone health the correct endpoint to use to determine D requirements? Because if we're trying to do risk benefit ratios, should the bone be what we're looking at? And I, I think that you can challenge this pretty seriously by simply saying, we don't have good evidence it is the right endpoint. Um, we don't know what the right endpoint is. But one of the more intriguing observations that was made now a little over 10 years ago is the number of genes which look like they can be activated or acted upon uh, by vitamin D. And the low estimate is approximately 3%. So if it's 3% and potentially up to 10% of the human genome that can be influenced by 125 of the pathway, um, there probably are multiple endpoints that we should be evaluating. In addition to that, we have non-genomic actions of vitamin D, which are very poorly understood. So in this case, it's when your 125 just binds to the, the vitamin D receptor and cavioli membranes, and you can immediately get uh, transcript production. So how important this is, what are the potential biomarkers for it? At this point, largely unknown. Uh, what I think, though, is becoming accepted, that is, in addition to mineral homeostasis at the bone, kidney, intestine, we have a number of other cells which can be affected by it, including um, particularly the immune system. And this concept now that it's influencing cardiovascular, respiratory health, obesity, erythropoiesis, I think is fairly well entrenched in the literature. I want to give a couple of examples of it because it leads to where, how we might begin to be thinking about looking at vitamin D and measuring it. And in terms of arterial stiffness and vascular function, with D intervention trials, again, oftentimes these are with six to seven to 8,000 international units daily for several weeks, we see improvements in endothelial response. That's on about the same order of magnitude you see with the flavin 3 ls which are getting a lot of attention. If you do, um, meta-analysis, there's been a pr pretty good consistency that if you look at total cardiovascular health, MI stroke, that those individuals who have higher circulating D have a reduced risk. You can break this into looking at the prevalence of risk factors in hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, or all, all follow the same patterns. 
Here you start getting worried, are you looking at cause or effect? And you can say, well, let's look at all cause death, because one thing that's gotten a lot of attention in the past is maybe there's an increased risk for cancer. Um, but the more recent meta-analysis suggests that risk for total cancer death also is reduced. So a lot of push suggesting that maybe more vitamin D would be a benefit. And now vitamin D deficiency is routinely associated with impaired endothelial function, arterial stiffness, and some diseases like diabetes and, in and insulin. All that story sounding interesting, but then it gets complicated because if you, a recent report suggests if you look at microvascular function and you give high levels of vitamin D, it's also influenced, but you see reduced blood flow. Perhaps just as significant, there's marked differences if you look at Caucasian population versus if you look at Asian uh, Indians, suggesting that pigmentation has an effect. One of the th suggestions is maybe we can start insorting this by doing genome-wide analysis. And this is particularly occurring with immune function. And this is a very busy slide, but all I want to, to point out with it is if you look at individuals with low circulating D versus higher circulating D, you get very distinctive gene patterns which are either turned on or repressed uh, in the two groups of subjects which maybe starts getting a hint of, is this a new type of biomarker one could exploit? How an individual responds to acute D um, supplementation would get us past to simply saying what are circulating vitamin D levels, and are those changes beneficial or not? Vitamin D toxicity, of course, has a lot of concerns out there, and that's why people have suggested not to do T D supplements. The problem is with the literature base is it varies tremendously in terms of duration, if it's intermittent D or daily, or if it's uh, intramuscular versus being taken orally. When you really pull the D papers together, they're all over the board. And they suffer from a lack of quality of biomarkers. And we don't really know what good physiological biomarkers for vitamin D status might be. Uh, to get put in perspective, though, when one says we worry about D toxicity, most of the papers, in, term, in terms of intoxication, you're talking 250 up to close to 5 million IUs. So we're mag orders of magnitude away from what's being used in clinical trials. And this is, again, demonstrated when you simply plot out what are the effects of vitamin D in terms of toxicity on serum 25-hydroxy, which are followed, and they're usually in 500,000-plus cases. So these are accidental poisonings. And yet, this somehow has gotten lost, I think, in the literature that maybe there's a large safety window. And in many cases, it's simply speculated that the vitamin D was inappropriately uh, the concentration of it, either in a supplement or a food product. So very, very soft literature. We start trying to model, how can we do risk-benefit ratios, and you have this type of data set, the risk is awful, is extremely hard to do. We can contrast that to looking again at supplementation trials for efficacy, and in a recent one looking at reducing the risk for preeclampsia, where they're giving 35,000 uh, IU, 5,000 units a day throughout pregnancy, there's no apparent evidence of toxicity. That wasn't the point of the paper. The paper was looking at the positive effects, but again, I would submit if we were careful about it, we could start informing where the UL might be by exploiting these type of studies. Is there a J-shaped curve? Uh, this particular paper by Stolzenberg got a lot of attention for suggesting that the risk, specifically of pancreatic cancer, is increased at relatively high levels of vitamin D in the serum. Uh, but this paper has been challenged by a few groups in just a, in terms of the mathematics of it, uh, with other groups saying adamantly there is no J-shaped curve. Uh, J-shaped curve, and I think it again points to the fact we need well-defined studies that are long-term, we, we can answer this a little bit more carefully. Uh, so far, out of the meta-analysis reports that are coming out, and notice most of these are 2014, so it's very fast data. The evidence of J-shaped curves for cancer seems to be disappearing. There's still reports that you see it for bone fractures at a very high level as a circulating D. You see an increased risk of fracturing. The problem is, is that many individuals take supplements once they've had diagnosed bone disease, so we may be artificially increasing serum D levels. I'll end with a few comments about how much should we worry about there being 
uh, genetic factors here. It was a decade ago, uh, in, in December, when New England Journal put a fairly controversial paper out saying, Should, is it time for race-based therapeutics? And interestingly, it was done uh, for isosorbide dinitrate, which is a source of nitric oxide in vascular health. And we now have, I think, a large set of data that compared to whites, blacks have significantly higher rates of hypertension, preeclampsia, which suggests they have lower circulating D, but they have higher bone mineral density and lower rates of osteoporosis. So we have dueling endpoints of D deficiency that on the surface you'd say, so, so what do we do with this information? The thing I think we could argue is that we have to be very careful when we're analyzing data that's coming off from the clinical trials to look at the genetic background of the individual. And perhaps if it turns out that indeed uh, there are marked differences, then just like the DRI and, and said in the 97 that genetics should be considered, maybe we're getting closer to the point where this should be done on a serious basis. And that's been the point raised in a couple of recent large reviews about where are we on deficiency in cardiovascular disease. And the call has been largely for we must have clinical, randomized clinical trials that are quite large in nature that also talk about the genetic background of the individual. And the same trials are being at least uh, proposed during pregnancy. How can we move forward? We need new vitamin D biomarkers. The status of simply following 25-hydroxy-D is not adequate. So I'd suggest we should start thinking of functional biomarkers, immune response, vascular health, perhaps FND. And we need sensitive, sensitive and early markers for excess and toxicity. We effectively don't have any right now. And just to remind you that we do have genes that we can identify. So thinking out of the box, and rather than using static indicators, can we use functional indicators? might be the way we can sort out between deficiency versus toxicity. Because ultimately what we have are changing expectations. That top curve, it's so clean if we have EARs, RDAs, ULs, keeping in mind that there is a range of safety that we don't know what that range of safety is above the UL. When we use a simple readout like bone, once you start going into vascular or immune modulation, we're going to shift the curve, according to current data, substantially over. And so now suddenly identify what that zone of safety is where you have the UL versus when you actually start getting into trouble uh, becomes more important that we investigate that. So just to summarize, controversy at this point exists as how to best determine vitamin D status and what cutoffs to use deficiency. And this controversy is in part because we're asking vitamin D to do different things now. And so using that nice biomarker that was adequate for bone health may not be for everything else. We have to start asking ourselves, what is going to be, what do we mean by optimal vitamin D status? And do we have di different dietary recommendations for different genetic groups, which may have different susceptibilities for some of the chronic diseases that were talked in the last few presentations? We need large-scale randomized trials uh, to look at not just the efficacy of vitamin D for some of these disease states, but also on safety profiles. And it should be easy to build that second, the safety profile data, into the ongoing trials. So as an overall conclusion, I think respect to vitamin D risk benefit calculations, I would argue we should take into account multiple health parameters, bone health, vascular immune. Uh, it would make a little bit more of a difficult model, but maybe it's more realistic if we want to capture what different genetic groups are actually need. And the risk-benefit calculation should take into account the genetic backgrounds of individuals. And we urgently need, I think, more research on sensitive biomarkers, not just for deficiency and toxicity. And I say this, keep it in mind, that effectively clinical trials with what you would call very high levels of vitamin D are regularly going on now on a global basis uh, with little attention being paid to the possible excess effects. Thank you.